This is Seeking Delphi, episode number 28, Future Driving, Part 3, Intelligent Traffic Control. I'm Mark Sackler. The future lives here. In the first two parts of this future driving series, we learned about cutting-edge technology in self-driving cars and flying cars. Exciting? Yes. But most of us will still be driving the same old grounded, manually driven vehicles for many years to come. And with that comes the frustration of traffic congestion. Can technology do anything to help us old school drivers with that? GPS apps can help somewhat by rooting us around the tie-ups, though that's an everyone for themselves approach. It turns out that there is another way to go that can lessen the frequency and severity of those tie-ups. Rapid Flow Technologies, based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, is using advanced sensors, distributed computing, and artificial intelligence to control traffic signals and maximize vehicle flow rates at the key points of urban congestion. To find out more about this approach, I put in a call to Rapid Flow CEO Griffin Schultz in his Pittsburgh office. Here's what he had to say. Griffin, welcome to Seeking Delphi, and thank you for joining me here today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's great to be here. To start with, Griffin, just tell us a little bit about how Rapid Flow Technology came into being as an intelligent traffic control company and how you joined what your role is. Yeah, sure. So Rapid Flow Technologies is based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and it was founded by two folks from Carnegie Mellon University which many will know as one of the preeminent universities in the world around artificial intelligence. So the two founders of the company who invented our main technology called SureTrack are Steve Smith and Greg Barlow. And they started deploying the technology while they're still at, at Carnegie Mellon CMU in 2012 here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and finished that deployment around 2015 or 2016. That's when they formally spun the business out and added several more customers, including the city of Atlanta, Portland, Maine, among others. And then I joined the company just this past March. Um, The company was primarily just technology folks that were working on the artificial intelligence. So I've come on board as the CEO to um, help grow the business and focus on strategy and, and the commercial and sales side. So the, your primary technology, as I understand it, is called SureTrack. That's what you're using to try and uh, control, mitigate, whatever help traffic conditions. So tell us a little bit about what that is, how it works. Yeah, so SureTrack, it's, it's pretty simple the way it's set up, you know, complex in, 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 um, in the guts of how it works, but, but a pretty simple concept to understand. So it's an artificial uh, intelligence edge computing system that sits uh, and computes at every intersection uh, where it's deployed. So we take a detection feed at the intersection, which ideally is a video camera, and we don't provide the detection. We rely on partners to do that. Lots of cities have existing detection systems already there, but uh, it can be a video detector, a radar detector, induction loops, but video detection is best. So imagine a video camera identifying all the different types of cars and pedestrians and buses and, and, and various travelers at an intersection. We get that feed into our system, and then our artificial intelligence planning optimization algorithms digest that information. Every second, they come up with a new plan to best move that traffic through that intersection and reduce travel times as, as much as possible in the most efficient way. Once they, the, the system has that plan, it sends a signal to the, the traffic control signal, which is, are the lights, and you know, we'll change from green, yellow to red based on that plan. And then the intersection will then communicate to the neighboring intersections what that plan is so that the neighboring intersections can take that plan into account when they plan the optimization for their intersection. And this is a decentralized system, again, where every intersection can make its own optimization plan, but the intersections communicate, which allow coordination across intersections, which is also very important. So you get the benefit of of local optimization as well as coordinated optimization across uh, a a broader system. So that's um, that's SureTrack and generally how it works. In that real urban world, of course, you've got more than 
cars, you've got buses, motorcycles, pedestrians, bicycles. You even have bicycle taxis out, out there, and who knows? And right. internationally, you might even have rickshaws. So how are you? How are you dealing with all that stuff? SureTrack is built to be multimodal from from the beginning. Now we do rely on the detection system to tell us what's actually at the intersection. So some detection systems are better at doing that. But so long as SureTrack has a good read of what's going on at the intersection, we can take all of those multimodal traffic systems into uh, account. In fact, you have some intersections in a city where the city might want to optimize pedestrians over vehicles. I'll give you a real world example. Portland, Maine is one of our customers. They have a lot of cruise ships that come into their harbor. And in that harbor area, you have people walking from the cruise ships a few blocks into the, into the downtown area where they're shopping and going to restaurants. For that area, at certain times, you want to optimize for pedestrians and, and not optimize for the vehicle traffic. But in other areas of the city that are more industrial, where you might have deliveries going on, you want to optimize for, for trucks and, 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 um, and vehicles. So because we are a decentralized system uh, where you can configure different intersections to work differently, uh, you can optimize for pedestrians at, at one or a number of intersections and vehicles at another, or you can, you can make it more dynamic and, and base it on certain parameters. But we definitely handle multimodal traffic. That is a, it's an absolute necessity in, in uh, 21st century uh, urban environments for sure. How has it, it worked out? What have been the, the results so far? How effective has it been? Yeah, so when we measure its effectiveness against existing systems, we've seen anywhere from 20, uh, or I should say 18 to 40% improvement in the factors that cause traffic congestion. For example, what we want to reduce primarily are, when we talk about vehicles, stopping, once they do stop, we want to, We don't want to stop them too long because then they're idling. Stopping and idling uh, increases travel time. We want to reduce travel time. Stopping and idling. Stopping creates wear and tear on the roads. Stopping and idling causes more pollution. People use more fuel, so um, it's less fuel efficient. So those are some of the measures that we're focused on, and that's what we've been able to reduce those types of things by 20 to 40 percent, which generally really, uh, reduces overall travel time. But again, it depends on what the city is trying to optimize for, uh, whether it's travel times or pedestrian. And, and again, it can vary across cities or parts of the city. But again, usually we're seeing 20 to 40 percent improvements in, in the, the factors that, that cause congestion. So obviously the pilot program was the Pittsburgh prototype. Give us a little bit of that history. How has it worked out and where is it going uh, in the future? Is it expanding? Yes. Yeah, so... Pittsburgh, because it was the first city, it, it grew in, by, by chunks of intersections over time, which is another benefit of a de- decentralized system. We don't have to take over the whole system at once. A city can add intersections. In the case of Pittsburgh, it was more of a, of a, of a test phase when the technology was, was first being developed. But for other cities today that, that where we might deploy, it's just more about funding. You know, they can add intersections as the funds become available. But back to Pittsburgh, so from 2012 to 2016, the city added about anywhere from five to six to 12 to 15 intersections per year in connected but different neighborhoods in the city. And this is where we saw that we were on the high end in Pittsburgh, you know, close to that 40% improvement because Pittsburgh, if for folks that have been here, it's, it's an older city with a pretty constrained and tight uh, and and, and uh, unpredictable traffic network. We have some, it, it's, it's not really set up like a uniform grid of vertical and horizontal roads. There's a lot of diagonals and, and sideways roads. So, so it's a pretty complex system, which is where a decentralized edge computing uh, network solution like ours really shines. So we saw some of the best results that we've seen in any of our deployments in, in Pittsburgh. So that's what you know, allowed the city to continue to deploy more over time. So we've got about 50 intersections now in total in Pittsburgh, and they have plans to do about another 120 to 150, which would bring them up to about 200. And there are 600 signaled intersections in the city of Pittsburgh, but about two to 300 are in the main downtown area. 
and what you would really need to control most of the city's transportation infrastructure. So we're really excited about that, that future full deployment, because that will really allow us to control the entire system and and really have a a bigger impact on uh, traffic control. I'm going to get back to the Pittsburgh and the funding issues in a bit. But first, being that this podcast is first and foremost about the future, let's talk about some of the other things going on in the future and driving the most obvious being autonomous vehicles. I mean, we're there, there, you know, in fact, Pittsburgh is one of the the cities. I think Lyft is uh, testing them there. I was actually given the option to get a Lyft ride uh, in an autonomous vehicle when I was there for the Association of Professional Futurist meetings. So how are you going to deal with the uh, the autonomous vehicles coming online? At first, a few of them, but eventually maybe a lot of them. Yeah, Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh right now is just uh, also on the cutting edge of autonomous driving and and a lot of those types of technologies. So we'll see a lot of that here. We can't wait for more connected and autonomous vehicles on the road because SureTrack will only operate better when when those systems are more available. So first, let's talk about connected vehicles. And I listened to, to, to the first podcast in the series about connected and autonomous vehicles. For folks that didn't hear that, connected vehicles are just vehicles, and, and these are available today, that not pervasively, but, but there are some models that have this, that can communicate with the intersection and subsequently our, our software. So when, it, when a vehicle comes up to one of our intersections that, that's running SureTrack, if it can tell us its destination or trajectory through the intersection, I'm going straight, I'm going left, I'm going right, which video detection and other radar detection certainly can't determine. So right now, SureTrack has to make assumptions about, it's very calculated, you know, machine learning based assumptions that, that are very sound and, 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 and highly accurate, but still they're, they're assumptions. If a car can tell us where it's actually going, then we don't have to make its assumptions. We know better exactly where that, that car is going to go. We can optimize that car and all the other traffic more efficiently because there's less uncertainty at that intersection about where various cars are going to travel. So having vehicles with the ability to tell us where they're going will allow SureTrack to improve even more. We've seen, as I mentioned, 20 to 40% improvement with just SureTrack not having this information. And we've run uh, tests that show we can get another 20% and increasing as more connected vehicles beyond 20% improvement on top of that 20 20 to 40% improvement when vehicles can tell us where they're going. So we can't wait for more connected vehicles. In fact, we've already run some beta tests with the city of Pittsburgh and Atlanta to put connected technologies on their buses. And we're just, um, we've run some tests. It's been successful. We're waiting for them to deploy them more broadly on their buses, but we're going to have the buses start communicating with the sure track intersections in, in the near future. And then with autonomous vehicles, not only will they be able to communicate with the intersection, but we could communicate back with them. And for example, you could tell an, an autonomous vehicle, uh, once you know its trajectory, you know, if, if you travel, for example, at, you know, 17 miles per hour, I know you want to go straight through the next five intersections. You know, SureTrack will keep those green if you travel at 17 miles per hour and you can best uh, optimize your fuel consumption. You won't have any stops and you'll get the best travel time through this section. We could even in the future potentially reroute autonomous vehicles based on congestion as needed with that back and forth communication. If we know where they're going, planned route, if, if that's not the most efficient way to get them there, we could move them you know, in, in, in another direction. So we can't wait for uh, you know, more connected and autonomous vehicles. Having said that, I go to a lot of ITS and smart city uh, conferences, ITS being intelligent traffic systems, and all the folks I talk to say that, you know, this is years, if not decades away. So there's going to be a long shoulder period while we wait for more adoption. But yeah, we, we can't wait for, for more of that to happen. Well, let me ask you the same thing that I asked Alex Wiglinski in the very first part of this three-part series on future driving. And that is, Maybe we eventually do get to mostly autonomous vehicles, but whether we do or not in the interim, we're going to go through periods where with varying degrees, some will be and some won't be. How do we deal with a mix of some on and some off? 
Yeah, I, I heard your question to, to your guest on that point, and I think we don't really have an issue with that because we don't necessarily we're, we're not um, we're not determining you know whether yeah you know, how that car should operate. We're just communicating with it, directing it through the intersection. So we don't really care whether there's 10% adoption or 90% adoption. However, again, we have results that show at 10% adoption we can get an additional 22% improvement at 90% adoption. I forget what the number is, but it's higher than that. I want to say it's, I'd have to go to our chart, but it might be as high as an additional 50, 60% improvement or higher. So we can operate in either environment. It's just that the, the quicker there is adoption, the better everybody travels uh, through the intersection, the less uncertainty our software has to deal with and the better it can optimize. Let's get back now to something you mentioned to get toward a conclusion here with the Pittsburgh situation. You talked about getting funding. That's obviously an issue. So how are you managing to get the cities to fund this? How are you monetizing it? And and, and even I might ask you, is there any indication that they can get some return on investment, whether it's increased productivity and making the cities more, more livable? Can that be quantified? And obviously, the savings and wear and tear on the road and, and accident and pollution, I'm sure, are an issue. But have you, have you looked at all that as part of the, the total business model? Yes, we have. And right now, cities are pretty used to pay, paying for transportation infrastructure, especially at the intersection with upfront funds uh, that they oftentimes they'll get from special grants or programs from, at least in the U.S., from state and federal government. So I wouldn't say that's easy, but that money is available and there's a lot of programs to, to upgrade intersections. But it is challenging and it's certainly challenging to increase, you know, longer term operating budgets. So that is a bit of a challenge for us in the short term, just as it is for anybody, you know, in, in the urban transportation space. That's why we are looking at some longer term models where we might do some revenue share with the city and help them monetize their transportation infrastructure in a different way. That can be a touchy subject. We are looking at models where you do that equitably, make it voluntary. So travelers, non-travelers, taxpayers, the city, commuters, everybody benefits because, you know, the, that can be a tricky political thing. But we are looking at some longer-term models, and we're talking with some of our, our customers, the, the, the very cities who are interested in things like this. If you look at the city of London, if you look at Singapore, they've created some congestion-based pricing for traveling in the cities. Cities are more interested in doing this in, a, in an equitable and, and voluntary manner. So we're taking a lot of feedback from cities and partnering with them, trying to figure out a way because ultimately they're our customer and figure out a way to, to address that issue. So it's not a huge one in the short term, but something we are looking at and partnering with the cities to see if there are some more creative ways to, um, to get this you know, really powerful technology deployed more broadly. So in the near future, who else can look forward to uh, seeing this technology? Where are you going in the near future? Yeah, so we are got a lot of opportunities across the U.S. The, there, there's a, actually a lot of interest in the Northeast. Portland, Maine, I, I think, was the first city in the Northeast where we deployed. But we're also in, in Needham, Massachusetts, and uh, we're deploying in Quincy, Massachusetts right now. There's talk about Beverly Hills, California. We've got a deployment coming up in Illinois another in Pennsylvania, one in Connecticut, actually, uh, in, in your neck of the woods. So yes, all over. But there seems to be a lot of interest in, in the Northeast at the moment, which makes sense because a lot of the Northeastern cities are Pittsburgh. They're older with a more constrained transportation infrastructure and, and uh, you know, significant congestion issues. Well, I got to say, I'd love to see this come to New to New Haven, where we have perfectly asynchronous lights. And even when there's no traffic, I have to leave a ridiculous amount of time to get where I'm going, because it seems like you hit every traffic light, even when there is no traffic. So I certainly yeah. w would hope to see that. But at any rate, this, this sounds really interesting. And clearly, as the technology gets more complex, and as uh, there are more sensors, more Internet of Things connected, more ambient computing, it makes sense to make use of this technology. So I wish you the best of luck going forward. And again, I thank you for joining me here today. 
Yeah, I, I appreciate the time. And, and just to your last point, yeah, everybody has, almost everybody has a personal experience with traffic congestion, whether they're, they're walking through it or, or driving through it. So it's, it's something that, you know, everybody has to deal with. So we are, our, our vision here is to improve people's lives by reducing the negative effects of, of traffic congestion. So it's something that we're really passionate about. And I appreciate the time to, to talk about it. And I'd you know, love to get people's feedback uh, if they listen to the podcast and would love to further engage in this conversation. So thanks. The issues for achieving fully autonomous driving are far-ranging and complex. No one knows for sure when, or even if, fully self-driving cars will ever become a mass market staple. And the issues involved pale in comparison to those surrounding flying cars. Let's conclude, though, this future driving series on a high note. If one thing's clear, there's plenty of cutting-edge technology that can make future driving safer and less frustrating than it is today, even without full autonomy. Driver assistance technology, as found in Level 1 and 2 autonomous vehicles, and intelligent traffic control, as portrayed by rapid flow technology, have the potential to make the motoring of the future, indeed, more efficient and safe. Links to relevant websites and stories can be found on the blog page for this podcast at www.seekingdelphi.com. These programs can be downloaded from iTunes and Player FM, and you can follow us on Facebook. Thanks for joining me. My technical assistant is Mohamed Marouf. And until next time, I'm Mark Sackler. <laughs>